Oh, okay. We're on live. Yeah. So I just dropped the live stream link in the chat. Again, there is a chat over there as well. So just when you get to the Q&A, keep an eye on both. And we'll probably get about 15, 20 people viewing it there too. So um, yeah. So I just dropped the live stream link in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> over there as well so just when you get to the q a keep an eye on both yeah so uh, uh 15, 20 people yeah i mean if that's the there's a, if somebody could mute that that's coming yeah, through so drop the live stream link in the chat yeah. <laughs> you're gonna hear the feedback now <laughs> so here i'm gonna make igor and alice co-hosts okay uh, i will be on a uh, on youtube so i will check great thank you and again, I'm going to have to drop off in maybe about 10 minutes, but I think you all are all set. So feel free to uh, jump right in. So when we stop the meeting, it'll just end, right? The YouTube live. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to worry about it. And then the recording will, will automatically be there. The, yeah, the live stream makes it very nice and easy. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, David. All right. I guess we should um, let's get start going. And I'd like to introduce Gurinda from Blue Bites. He's going to, um, it's a joint event for Happy Ledger London and Toronto Meta Group for the topic of how to harness blockchain for environmental and copper sustainability. Um, Karinda is the founder of Blue Bytes. He coaches leaders to adapt to changing market demands by embracing data-centric approaches, including blockchain, machine learning, and cloud technologies. He's led startup to Fortune 500 clients and their digital transformation through a combination of strategy, process, and training. He's published LinkedIn learning author who's always happy to engage in discussion of advancing socially responsible causes by employing technology. Um, so let's um, pass control to our speaker, Gurinda. Let me stop sharing my screen. Sure. Let's try it. Let me know when you guys can see it. Yep, we see it. All right. Um, yeah, so how to harness blockchain for sustainability and corporate responsibility. Um, ironically, I gave this kind of, uh, talk to a group that was on the other side. So they were a sustainability group. So coming full circle, um, I'm talking to the Hyperledger group on uh, from the blockchain side of things. So thank you for the introduction, Alice. And about myself, yes, so I am the founder of Blue Byte. Um, and I do have a LinkedIn learning course on Hyperledger Fabric on Azure, uh, which ironically at the time of this uh, discussion, I'm in the process of updating because as you know, with technology, everything changes relatively fast. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, okay, that's all great, but what does that, why should you be speaking about uh, sustainability and blockchain? So from my side, uh, I've actually over the last year, and it's something that I guess is the first discussion where I'm actually talking about it. Uh, it's been part of a covert startup. So I'm a co-founder of it and we're focusing on actually, uh, it, it was a passion project between me and my uh, partner where we were looking to uh, make an impact and really uh, support sustainable causes beyond what, what was available. And um, having gone through hundreds of hours of, and tomes of information, I feel like I am much more knowledgeable in this space and I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, so it's a bit of a passion for me and I'm happy to share about it whenever I can. And I do want to thank you, Senate Executive Matt Van. So he, he's also an author and he introduced me to this group and Alice and so he has a book on the um, Smart chain contracts. So if you are interested in that kind of stuff, uh, you can you can reference that. Now, from my side, this talk is going to be at a higher level, a little bit about uh, from a bigger picture what's going on. Uh, I'm not diving into the deep technical details, and if there's interest in that, that can be done in a future time. Uh, obviously, we are in the early stage, so I can't really release all that information at this point in time. But I'm happy to talk about it further down the pipeline. So let's dive in. How do you define sustainability? Uh, that's a trickier question than when you might think, when you might first think. It really depends on the person. Uh, different people have a very different understanding of what sustainability is. Uh, for some people, that might be reduction of poverty. For others, it may be uh, a green footprint. 
climate change. Uh, yet for others, it, it may be focused on uh, slave labor. So we have to really, uh, when we're talking about this, there's multiple ways to look at it. And talking to that a little bit, it's, uh, if we take a look at it from three different perspectives, it starts to really make a little bit more sense. So uh, from the UN perspective, we have the Sustainability Development Goals, which are a set of 17 goals. So they, they targeted what, what is a, the future for our species? What, what do we need to do to ensure a certain living standard, ensure a better planet? Um, so they came up with 17 of them. There's over 170 um, initiatives under there, uh, and then over 230 ways to inspect it. So there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, and that's what I'm trying to say from a bigger picture perspective. When you are looking at it from a governmental perspective, that's what they're trying to tie into. Uh, and this is, this is sort of the push that's going on currently. Now, from a consumer side, we are seeing trends where uh, newer generations, so we're talking about millennial generation Z, are much more interested in the impact of uh, they speak with their wallets, right? So they're, they're willing to spend more if a product is uh, sustainability, sustainably produced, um, if, the, if it may be locally produced, there's different avenues and they will actually uh, pay into that. Now, for them, it ties down to their branding, right? So if, if a product aligns with my personal goals, then it, I'm really speaking by my purchasing, I'm speaking to who I am. And we're seeing that as a higher and higher trend. From a corporate perspective, uh, we see a lot of organizations that are now starting to realize that sustainability is actually, in fact, very core to their future. Uh, it's very targeted. Uh, and in fact, uh, being sustainable is also being financially viable for us in the future, right? Uh, so we have B Corps that are really focused on this kind of stuff. But then we have trailblazers, uh, Unilever. So they are the uh, the largest consumer goods corporation. And they they are by far one of the leaders in the space. Um, and they've realized that in order for them to be, uh, for them to be viable in the future, they need to be sustainable. And it really ties into the their brand. Okay. So enough about that, let's talk a little bit about applications. And then I'll start diving in. Um, I'm gonna target supply chains and I'll talk a little bit about as to why. Uh, but at a higher level, blockchains can target various aspects of sustainability. They can, they can talk to a lot of different areas, right? So if we're looking at, for instance, donations, as a donor, I could know where my money is being spent. I would have much more visibility into it. I could understand what is the overhead of getting something. So even if it, if it is clothing that uh, goes to a certain locale, uh, you know, there's a shipping cost, there's a management overhead, there's all these kind of things. It would be good to be able to see that. Targeting corruption. So one of the things that we see often is corruption is rampant in areas where data is funneled. There's, there's a less, there's not enough sharing going on in, in terms of the information. Uh, that is available out there. So as soon as we make the, that information available, it makes it more difficult to actually have corrupt practices. And what we, we start seeing is, uh, even from a governmental perspective, we can start saying, uh, as, um, as citizens, we can have clearer understanding of where uh, monies are being spent, how public funds are being used, and that kind of thing. Reduction of bureaucracy is, um, I haven't met anyone that really likes bureaucracy unless you're um, you're part of the race from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that was the bureaucracy one in particular. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of uh, components that can be automated and we start seeing that within blockchains. And I'll talk a little bit about that for a little while. Identification for refugees. So this is actually something that's currently ongoing. Um, now, one of the issues that you have with refugees is, uh, it, you know, they may not have a single address. There's, there's a lot going on. Uh, they need access to healthcare, but we still need to be able to measure that. Uh, and so we see efforts in that space. The localization for economies. Um, so this is in two ways. You know, we, for localization, we can see 
uh, you may choose that you want to support farmers. So for instance, uh, you want to support a co-op and there are actually um, efforts in that space. And when you buy, let's say your beans from this particular group, you, you know that there's a living standard that they're working with uh, and you start, you start benefiting that. So it's part, it, it's part of what you're supporting. The other side of it, you do see uh, as, as in you might be purchasing within this region and we're able to tell, you know, if I'm doing a purchase, what's the value that I'm adding to my local economy and how is that going to benefit? And finally, supply chain. Now, supply chains are a tricky space. There's a lot of complexity there, but I'll say this. Um, you cannot be sustainable if your supply chain isn't. The su sustainability is that integrated into supply chain. It is that necessary. Supply chains are that that larger part of uh, organizations that they need to be tackled in order for organizations to even consider sustainability. Your footprint isn't just your own footprint, it's also uh, your partners and all that, um, all the different avenues of your supply chain. So let's just dive into that. What is a supply chain? So I'll talk a little bit from a higher level um, and eventually I'll, I'll circle around back to the uh, sustainability component and how it dives back into blockchain. So when we look at supply chains, uh, we have the planning phases. So this is where product design, uh, how are we putting something together, sourcing, that may be materials, uh, down to manufacturing. So we get uh, the product created, right? And it may not be local, it may be uh, overseas. Now, it's not that different whether it's a software product or it's an it's a actual regional product. Um, even with software production, we see a lot of work being done overseas. The components of our supply chain really become our vendors. They also become our developers, that kind of thing. Right? So we have QA test teams. Uh, we have various components, that kind of thing. Now, the next part of that is delivery logistics, getting it into the customer hands, and finally, returns. Uh, so there, there's, given... And COVID makes this much more obvious, but uh, given the number of purchases going online, people don't see certain items. Um, and so returns, what happens with those returns? Are they discarded? How are they dealt with? How are they put back into the system? So this introduces uh, a lot of issues. Let's start off with complexity. So we've gone from localized to international uh, supply chains. We've got, moved away from having a organization that just uh, it traditionally works in of itself, but we work with partners. They focus on certain areas. They, they have strengths that we don't. And it, with an international supply chain, that adds an overhead. Um, that may be from regulations. We have a lot of moving parts. Uh, we have to consider port congestion, port authority, uh, even the drivers, uh, get, getting the actual products once they are a, in the country to the specific consumer or the right warehouses. There's a lot of things that need to be coordinated. Now on top of that, we start seeing volatility. That may be in the form of tariffs um, and even supernatural events. So COVID, it was a great example of volatility. We saw, for instance, meat packing plants that were, sorry, meat plants. I'm vegetarian, so uh, my terminology on meats may be, may be off a little bit. So we, we did see that during COVID, a lot of uh, plants had that issue with, with workers getting sick. So they were unable to deliver at a certain grade. You'd have plants that would shut down that, that needed to remain shut down for a certain period of time. So that was the food supply chain that actually got impacted by this. When you start realizing this when you have these kind of supernatural events that our supply chains are not, they are more volatile than we like to think. We don't normally think about that until something like that happens. The next part is pipeline visibility. So as we increase the amount of infrastructure that we have, we also have to increase resources. And ironically, we, that increases the cost. Uh, part, part of why we go with, with the international supply chain is to reduce costs, but it does introduce overhead and uh, that needs to be managed. Last part is cascading suppliers. So there is an impact on organizations depending on the type of supplier that you, you choose. So we've heard multiple times the issues with Foxconn that Apple's had in the past. 
um, there was a there was an a retail organization in the UK where one of the not a direct partner but their partner's partner ended up um, using slave labor. Now, from a consumer perspective, they didn't the consumers didn't hold those those organizations. Uh, weren't angry with those organizations. They were angry with the parent organization. So really, you, you have a responsibility. And from a consumer perspective, the responsibility lies at the root. It doesn't lie uh, at the lower level. And that's something that you have to be aware of. As an organization, there is a certain credibility that, that impacts you. So how can blockchains benefit this kind of process? Actually, I'm talking about benefits of blockchain in general. Um, we know from collaboration perspective, uh, we, we start looking at incentivization models, right? Uh, we don't consider not only a single, uh, single organization, but really the business model in of itself changes. Uh, and we can start considering that. And one of the things I will preference this by saying is for many organizations, this is a fundamental shift from the way they previously think. One of the things that commonly see is I see a lot of organizations go straight to tokenization. Can this product be tokenized? And I'm not against tokenization, but I think that you're jumping to a solution before you're exploring the problem. Um, and really what blockchain benefit is how do we move data from being siloed to it sharing it? And how are we uh, collaborating together? And that's, that's the real benefit of it. Next part is automation of processes. Uh, that can be onboarding, securing information to, uh, sorry, sourcing information to partners uh, so we can understand what is available, what isn't. And that rather than doing the traditional mechanism of uh, going via email, this can be much, much more automated, right? Uh, we can even include the product design and in fact, uh, marketing at, the, at that point. So that we have different departments that may be, in a single organization that they may not be working together, uh, that can be informed at the right time. And as part of the automation, we also get validation. Data security. This is something a lot of clients, especially when they're first looking at blockchain uh, solutions, are concerned about uh, the ability to secure your data. Now, with a hyperledger fabric network, we don't have to worry about uh, these issues, right? Uh, we know who the participants are. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say we don't have to worry about them. We, uh, some of these are handled and we can design for it, right? The network is built to, to address these issues. So we know who the participants are. We can even, depending on how we, uh, we provision our collections, how we provision our channels, we can source information to different organizations at the right time and still maintain our trade secrets. We don't have to worry about uh, giving away too much information. Next one is trust. Uh, anytime you're working with such a large group, and especially when you're looking at supply chain, we see an increase in the number of partnerships over time. Um, rather than having a human to human trust takes a long time, right? So we're, we're terrible at building that. It, it takes us a while to do that process. And now if you build trust into the network, it's much, much faster and much, much more um, aligned. So we can do auditing, for instance. Uh, we know the data can be validated. We know it's not manipulated. We can trust the information that's coming out of it. Now we can still build up our personal relationships, but uh, from a working together from an organizational perspective, it's much, much more beneficial. Finally, speed. Uh, this is two parts. So as we're seeing an increase in IoT uh, sensors, data across networks, and especially in supply chains, it's so much easier when you're, when you're able to have sensors do measurements and that kind of thing. Um, we can reduce latency, right? So if we're looking at alternatives, if, let's say we're looking at a non-blockchain network, um, you would need to put this, all this information in a data factory, and then, then it needs, we need to go through ETL processes. It's still data that needs to be managed, but we're managing the data at a later process. We're gathering it first, and then we're batching it together, and then we're pushing it in, uh, and we're streaming it, but, but it might not be localized. Whereas with uh, blockchain networks, what we can start doing is we can deploy them to, where, to those regions. Now, again, in cloud networks, yes, you can do that, 
but the overhead of it is significant and it's not a small overhead to consider, especially when you're architecting it. The other side of it is actually the human aspect of it. So when we start looking at working in parallel, we have our departments that can work in parallel, but we also have partners. You, rather than having our traditional silo data approach, everyone has access to the right information at the right time. They're able to make decisions much, much faster. We can get to market faster. So let's talk about a use case on this one. Vendor management related to IBM and Chainyard. Obviously, IBM is one of the largest companies. Uh, so they have a lot of vendors that they work with. They ended up creating a solution on Hyperledger uh, Fabric called Trust Your Supplier. And the issue that they were running with, onboarding uh, suppliers took a long time, validation, auditing, all of this, there's an overhead to it. You have to assign resources. And um, what about when you're, you're onboarding the new suppliers, you're offboarding old ones, you need to maintain all that information and it can be overwhelming. So what they saw immediately was a reduction uh, from 60 days to about three to four days. And obviously they were able to onboard uh, partners additional partners than they would previously. So th these are the kind of things that you start seeing from a supply chain. And this is only from onboarding. We're not talking about the procurement side. Uh, we're not talking about all the other avenues. So there, there's a lot of different areas in which we can actually see blockchain solutions. Okay, coming back to, uh, to sustainability and how it translates into supply chains. Supply chains are changing. Um, and what do I mean by that? It, it, traditionally, we saw a very linear way uh, of creation of products and consumption. So we would have resources, use those resources, create the product, consumer uses the product, and then it goes to waste. Um, now, that's not a great mechanism, and as a species, we're starting to see we're, we're at the limits of what we can push onto the planet. Uh, we have much more garbage than we need to, and in fact, if we look at it compared to other species on the planet, uh, nothing has the level of destruction that, that we do, right? So we need a better mechanism, obviously, for our own, not, not only for the planet, but for our own existence, right? Uh, we need to have a holistic system that considers um, considers the overall usage uh, of our product and reduces the amount of waste that we put out. So I'll talk about circular economy quickly here. One of the things I do want to mention when you're looking at circular economy, this is in early stages, this is being implemented. A lot of standards at this point in time are, are being validated, right? Uh, so this is not something that is, is a very old standard, let's put it that way. So future proofing, obviously, when you're it's seven different components, but we'll start with future proofing. Uh, when you're creating the item, how is it going to be used? What's the life cycle of it? A, is it a you know 30 day life cycle, or are we talking about a 10 year life cycle? And what does that look like? What does that mean? Okay, so from the design aspect, just the considerations, that kind of thing. Preserving it and extending. So this may be sourcing materials. I am just talking about one example in each of these buckets. I'm not going into much more depth because. That in of itself could be an entire talk and it could take a lot of time. But from preserving and extending. So um, if we source the right materials, we know certain materials in certain uh, situations will do better than others. And we need to be aware of that. And so what, what are we, how are we able to do that? Sustainable resource management. So one of the aspects of that is recycling. So how are we able to reuse the product in a different manner? Uh, and what, what does that look like? And, how, and that would partly extend its life cycle. Waste management is once a product is completed its life cycle, how does it support the system so that it can be used for other areas? So one of the things we see in Sweden, for instance, is uh, their, their waste management is so efficient that it actually is using a heating source. And these are the kind of uh, solutions we need to be looking at. Digital tech is definitely an area that is being explored, but we've never been in a part of our history where we're able to use, we have so much technology at our fingertips and we're able to produce uh, new solutions at this pace. Um, so we have, we have all this data that's available to us. We're, we're able to make decisions on it. Um, but at this point in time, we're still just exploring use cases. And I think 
that's where a lot of this, we're going to enable a lot of new business models. And that goes into the next part is actually business models themselves. We need to look at different business models. Traditionally, we're terrible at partnerships. Uh, we're terrible at looking at collaborative, collaborative business models. We kind of tend to think uh, singular organization aspects. Now, um, we do see collaboration when you're looking at like certain types of uh, companies, like car companies oftentimes. But what you'll see is there's a clear delineation uh, of what's being worked on when it, and who owns it, um, and there's a handoff process on that. Finally, collaboration, working better together. Okay, so I'm going to give a few examples of how blockchain might support different avenues of this. Yes, you could use a blockchain solution for the entirety of this, but my God, that would be a huge network and a, way too much information for one. Um, so a better mechanism is actually looking at different areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's start off with business models because that, that's an area that I think is quite interesting. Um, sharing economy is popular, but we, we're, we're just at cusps of it. And so what can we look at when we're, we're considering some of these, um, especially when we're looking at uh, from a blockchain perspective? For instance, we could consider sharing cost centers. Um, as an organization, I may be a retail organization, I may be working with partners that are in areas, regions that I'm looking to expand in. So I may be able to uh, share cost centers with them. So one of the things that I might be able to do is rent out warehouses. So we could start doing microtransactions from the perspective of uh, calculating what amount of space is available, who can rent what, uh, and I can calculate the growth from that. And I can actually start putting all that information into the network. Alternatively, another business model might be, considering we're on the same avenue, we have, let's say, three companies, five companies, 10 companies, whatever. They all decide to take on Amazon. And theoretically, it's possible. Why not? Um, now, what you're able to do on a blockchain model is let's start sharing information in a way that we're working as a corporate, but we're not, uh, we still grow on our own way. So we can all grow together. Uh, same sort of thing. Again, cost center is one way. We might start bundling shipping. We might start using benefits from each other, and we might calculate that and store that information onto that network, right? And then we can compare it to a traditional model and actually start making some of those decisions. Another area is collaboration. So we see a lot of forgery, um, and I'm not talking about actually clothes, but even from a food perspective, uh, honey has a big problem with that. Uh, so we have you know, high quality rice herbs are mimicking actual honey. And it's hard to tell. There's been a lot of tests, but every single time they do a test, uh, the, the individuals that are creating the uh, face products will create a better version of it. So it's harder and harder to manage that. But what if we were to, to a, incorporate that entire a blockchain network, right? So we, we have from the, we, we know the batches for when they're producing a beekeeper. Uh, we can measure that. Uh, we can even do it down. And what things we can start looking at is from a consumer perspective, when they're inputting, they know the value that they're getting. Uh, <clears throat> keep bees alive. And they're, they are fundamental to our growth as a species. Um, and one of the things that we don't realize is uh, how, how much effort that goes into that and how important they are. So as a consumer, I could see the benefit of that. And what that would give is, even from a beekeeper's perspective, there's a lot of pesticides that are then uh, reducing bee populations. And we could maintain a future that's a, a longer term future where we're able to live in harmony versus actually harm the, harm the animals that are actually benefiting us. So these are just two examples. There are many ways that you can go into this. Um, and I'm happy to, there's a lot of different ways that we could actually talk about this, right? Um, but going to the next stage and the final part of my presentation here. So we've talked so far about the 
first level of digital transformation. And those are just lift and shift models. And that's exactly what uh, IBM did. They, they, they took what was in, in the, what was happening manually and put it into a digital network, which is neat. And we see automation, we see some, uh, some benefits from that kind of system. But really, it, it's, we, it's the first level. There's not that, uh, it's not a fundamental shift. It's not a revolution. Um, and really, that's the next phase. What we're able to do in the digital world, which we cannot do in the physical world, that's where we start looking at certain avenues. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the startup I'm, uh, I, I'm working with. But keep in mind, I'm just uh, I'm not talking about uh, the actual, uh, I'm talking about the idea behind it. Um, I'm not going to go into details on the actual company and any, any of that kind of stuff. So imagine you have a product that allows you to be sustain a sustainability decision-making tool. We're able to now put together um, in information at, from different avenues. Right? And I'm able to make better decisions of where I am today and where I want it to be tomorrow. And I want to work with uh, multiple partners across that. So first part is obviously financial data. Financial data is not, uh, I'm not saying that exists on the blockchain network. That can exist outside of the network, but that, that can be amalgamated. And really, the benefit of a blockchain network is not the network itself. It's the data, right? And how are we working with all of that? The next part is actually tying into... Uh, our footprint. So maybe as an organization, I want to say I, I'm locally sourcing an item. Uh, if I'm a retailer, I want to say that, you know, I'm working with uh, uh, people in, in my local economy. I want to show my carbon footprint. I want to measure the carbon footprint of my partners. Um, I want to be able to put all of this information so that that's, that's something that I can measure right across the network. The next part is actually measuring brand value. What the worst thing you can tell a executive that isn't bought into something like this is, by the way, excuse me, we're going to spend some money to be more carbon neutral, um, and this is going to cost you X, Y, Z, because they tend to think uh, typically on a quarterly basis, right? And that's what their performance is tied to. Now, brand value is what your consumers see of you, and it's a longer-term measure. You're able to see what the impacts are and so you're you're able to tie some of this stuff into it i will say this is not a single blockchain network in fact we are using hyperledger fabrics uh, but there are other networks that are tying into this and it's necessary let's talk about some of the benefits that you start seeing out of this kind of system we start getting real-time feedback onto what's available uh what what is possible what's happening across the network um to communicate internally and with our partners what our goals are so we can say, you know what, we want to be the most sustainable t-shirt producer in the world. Uh, against our own uh, KPIs, and we can actually uh, manage our partners against that. So if a partner is not meeting that need, we can replace them. And that's as simple as we get. Uh, finally, from a consumer perspective, we're able to now communicate that back to them. So as a consumer, one of the most confusing things you can hear uh, is, and one of the biggest problems that we have in sustainability is greenwashing. Organizations claiming to be um, sustainable, but what they're really doing is spending a lot of marketing money, but they're not really showing that value after the fact. Uh, how are they doing that? How are they maintaining that? All that kind of value is not tied back into it. Um, so this is where you're able to actually work with consumers. So uh, that brings me to the end of the conversation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Green. Uh, please, if you have any question to our speaker, please feel free to ask. Okay, so uh, hi, this is Sai Chen. Uh, I have a couple questions, if I may. Sure. Um, so in, in looking at this, then are you implementing the collection of data for 
different corporate entities in their supply chain? Or are you implementing a certification of sustainability? Are you, um, you replacing one of the ESG metrics companies like Sustainalytics and, and whatnot? No, it's not a certification process, although it could be fed into a certification process, but that's not the goal of it. Um, me personally, I've never been a big fan of certification because it, it, they, they tend to be a time stamp uh, at, at a moment of time, right? Um, this is more for active, for organizations to really make decisions um, as they're going through, through their process. So uh, to communicate internally, but really to make your next decisions and really get that, that data at the right time. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ty. So I will say, um, if you do think of any questions and, and you don't have any right now, um, you can feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, yeah, but uh, sorry, sorry, day. Grinda, we have a, what you consider, uh, we have a, a question on chat, so. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, please, uh, please check. I wondered what you consider to be the key things that are currently blocking or preventing the adoption of blockchain for this kind of use cases, and how this might be overcome. Oh yeah, that's a great question. Actually, um, it's a two-parter. Actually, really. So there's misinformation of blockchain in general right now. Yeah, and it's a little bit of people understanding new technology. It doesn't, it's regardless of what technology you're working with, you do see that trend sometimes. Um, but the other side of the avenue is actually, even from the sustainability side, a lot of this is being figured out. And there's only a handful of companies that are really looking at this in a serious avenue. Um, so we are really at the early stages of what, what will be coming down the pipeline. And I'm, I'm not talking about in like one year, this is, multi-year, right? So even uh, a good example of the circular economy, the standards that they've put together, there's been issues when you're reviewing it from a uh, in the market uh, space uh, and measurements that are coming out of it, there needs to be further evaluation. So, so we have multiple things that are complexities that are really um, coming in that, that make it difficult to really understand, are you, are you sustainable or you're not, right? Um, and it's easy to say sometimes because different organizations have very different goals. So someone someone may have uh, a goal to be to have no child labor uh, or um, they, they want to reduce poverty, but they couldn't care less about their carbon footprint. Um, so the, that's a, you have complexities from that avenue too. Hi, so this is Sai Chen again. So where does the primary data that you put on the ledger come from? Like on this one of child labor, how do you... Well, we, we you have, we, we're targeting specific use cases to begin with. Um, the child labor one, we have, is, we are not targeting that one yet. It's on the feature set later on, uh, because that's, that's difficult to measure too, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the other avenue about it is when you start looking at that, okay, so um, either you can go down an identity route, right? Uh, but then there needs to be some sort of a, like, how do they get that identity and how is it associated that? Um, or from an auditing perspective, that, that kind of thing. What you can do relatively easily is you start looking at uh, probabilities, right? Uh, which spaces have these kind of issues and which ones have been busted and that kind of information. Uh, so you're better off looking at it from a information gathering source rather than the other side of it. But it, it is a very complex way to target it. Okay. So what is a kind of data that you're currently covering in what you do? Uh, currently, we're looking at carbon footprint. And organizations okay. that really have made that goal to be uh, green. And so that their, their goal is to be climate neutral, if you would, right? Okay, sure. 
So yeah. that, that, those, those are part, and, and what we've done from our side is we're, we're targeting a really handful set of organizations. We're not going to open market um, because the, the ones that are on this list are, they already know what they're doing and some of them have made issues. It's much more difficult when you go to an organization that hasn't made that commitment um, and you put them like this forward. Uh, the first thing you're gonna you're run, you're gonna run into is uh, issues with um, people uh, it, it, people issues. With, uh, it's a, from a management perspective, there, there's a shock. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you're gathering carbon emissions, like for example, from different facilities or from different um, divisions or, or subunits of a Yeah, of and a some company? of that is actually sourced by partner uh, networks. So it's not, some of that's actually not even on Fabric, some of that's on Hydro Alaska. Um, but we're, what we're able to do is we're able to get that information together and um, Put it into a usable format. Okay. Um, so it's not it's not on a single system. So the sure. financial data will never be on the uh, on the network because no organization is comfortable sharing it, and I, I don't think there's much benefit. Um, the the ones that are associated. So there are organizations that are particularly in the SDG space, but some of them are going even further, and we're working directly with them to uh, get that information. The second part, which is the one that's a little bit more interesting, is the brand value sort of like over time what does it mean right um because it really when you're making this uh the sustainability conversation it, it, it ties into the brand and uh how does the organization see itself or how does the executive uh see the organization um and so that's that's the one where we have a lot of interest and that's the one that we're tar targeting at this point in time okay so it's it's a network basically of different organizations contributing their emissions footprint kind of data that yeah like across organizational boundaries rather than within the same company. And I, yeah, and the goal is uh, is once you start doing that kind of stuff, you start seeing it's no longer siloed data, right? Yes, correct. Okay. So. Um, and, and that's why you target target a very specific set of companies. Otherwise, you'll never get very far. You need to be open to uh, there's a concept in sustainability of naked transparency. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And to some some organizations have that goal, a lot of them don't, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so you have to target target that set and really talk to them about that kind of thing. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, one more question uh, on the chat. One of the problem with hyperledger fabric is the identity management aspects. It's not recorded in an immutable ledger. How do you present participants from fa faking their identity? Um, so it's a great question. Uh, there, there's multiple ways you can look at it. It's, uh, I'm not going to talk to the actual solution that we did because we are, again, uh, early stages and we're finalizing some of these parts as we're rolling with clients to get a better understanding. Uh, but what you can do is if I have a cloud network, for instance, I can tie it into, for an organization, I can tie it to their identity. So I could use their identity provider and uh, start putting that together. So it might be uh, active directory, for instance. Um, and I'm able to do that. You might tie hyperledger indie and go go that route and uh, and tie that to the identity. It really depends on. It, it, that is a great question because yes, on, on the network you don't see that kind of information. But um, what is it that you want to record is what it comes down to, right? Um, but you're you are able to do it through identity managers that are outside of um, <clears throat> outside of the hyperledger space and put that information in there so we know we can tie it to an organization too. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone ha ha has has a question? Uh, 
I'll check our YouTube. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a special occasion too, uh, because uh, Sai Chen uh, is from uh, our special group, Hyperledger uh, Climate Action. Uh, Sai Chen, could, uh, could you share some words about this group? Because uh, this is in topic. Sure. Hi. So, uh, my name is Sai Chen, and thanks for your presentation, Gurinder, and, and okay. sharing what you've done. Uh, so I'm involved with the climate special interest group at Hyperledger. And um, so what we've been doing is some maybe somewhat similar to just the climate aspect of what you're doing, which is a more comprehensive ESG uh, solution. So we've been looking at how to get data on climate emissions and um, storing those on a fabric network. And then from there, creating tokens on a Ethereum slash Besu type of network so people could transact with those. So that's uh, kind of one of the projects that uh, we work on. And so that's why I ask you these questions because we've, we've dealt with similar issues like where to get the data and how to um, standardize it and record it. So if anybody's interested, yeah, that's, you can come check us out at the climate sync. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Grinda, uh, could you sh share how, how we can contact with you? Because uh, we, we put this information on our meetup, but could you remind how we can... Uh, um, best way is to search for me on LinkedIn, Grinda Um I do have Twitter, but I'm not very good at social media, I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> um, I'm very regular on LinkedIn, so uh, if you message me, you're, you're guaranteed to hear back. Um, uh, in fact, let me see. I can post my URL in the in the chat, I guess. But yeah, I'm I'm happy to have a discussion off uh, offline, and uh, if should anyone want to connect, I'm always happy to do so. Okay, th thank you. Uh, the uh, do you have any uh, any f future projects which you can share with us? Or what is on uh, on your plate now? Um. Sorry, my chat is disabled. Excuse me, could you repeat, sorry? Uh, the chat is disabled, I can't put in my information on there. Okay. Um, that is the project actually that, that I'm talking about. It's currently in its phases, we are in the, it, it, like I said, it was a passion project, but it takes a lot of energy to get it from uh, to have a discussion with the right people and get all of that going. And uh, more and more, it's taking taking up a larger part of my day, let's put it that way. Um, so if you are happy, I'm happy to share progress as I go through this, uh, this process, um, because a lot of this is new to me. And quite frankly, a, a lot of the organization we're working with is new to them too. Um, so I'm happy to have those discussions as I go through this. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, any question from, from our audience? Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, it's a great speech. And I think in January, you possibly will host another one um, with Matthew. So stay tuned, our channels. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Matthew is like the author of uh, various blockchain books. Oh, Matthew Zan, yes. Yeah, so he was the one that recommended me to the group. Um, yeah, and he has a, a lot of technical work in the space, so uh, it's good news. Yeah, the next top, yeah, he um, contacted me that he might be interested in hosting um, the topic on asset tokenization, a very popular topic. So yeah, stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.